I'm Kate, I'm uh, from Mozilla, and I work on writing features and experiments in Firefox in a newfangled, webby style of JavaScript that sometimes my coworkers get kind of uncomfortable about. However, I'm super excited to be here today because I'm gonna talk to you about using NPM for JavaScript in the browser. And we all love browsers, right? Yeah? Yes, all right, thumbs up, all right. So first I wanna take you back in time a little. All right, if my slides will go. There you go. So does anyone remember the web back in the late? Oh, no, no it's good. It's, it's supposed to be black. It's okay. <laughs> just, just wait for it. Wait for it. All right. So does anyone remember the web back in the late 90s? This was like when your phone was on the hook. This is what the internet looked like. Yes? Anybody late 90s? Early 2000s? Anyone writing for the web? Yeah? If you were, you probably remember that in those days, JavaScript was definitely not something you would have conferences about. Um, you know, you wouldn't. Uh, in the early days, you might have used it to maybe validate a form, or more likely, annoy the crap out of people with pop-ups. You know, thanks, JavaScript. In fact, people hated JavaScript so much, they actually wrote articles about how much it sucked. So I went on the Wayback Machine a little, and uh, I looked for this. So blindly accepting a high level of security risk on the web by enabling JavaScript is as shaky as a ride on the Canadian space shuttle made of birch bark and pine gum. So this is from stupid, yeah, right? Stupid JavaScript security tricks circa 1997. And this really hits home for me because, well, I'm Canadian and I love JavaScript. <laughs> you know? Um, so nowadays things are very different for front-end JavaScript. We have an incredible open source community. We have frameworks that are used by millions of people, robust applications and not so robust applications that are used by billions of people. You know, some people even work for companies where their flagship product is written at least partially in JavaScript, like me. Um, yay, and there's a lot of reasons why this is the case, like browser standardization, better dev tools, um, you know, code sharing platforms, but a huge part of it is thanks to Node and NPM. So this is really what it comes down to. In order to do first class work, we need good dependency management, okay? And I think today, by far, NPM is the most reliable, flexible, and powerful solution for front end JavaScript. This is true whether you're writing, you know, a newfangled, app that's you know, from scratch or dealing with a legacy code base. And I'm gonna show you what that looks like in a, a couple of different code bases. But first, I wanna tell you a little bit more about myself. You know I'm Canadian. So I really like cycling. This is a picture of me at a bike rally with about 500 other people fighting for bike lanes. Yeah. <laughs> and now you all hate me, you're like, oh, cyclists. Uh, so this is a picture of the waterfront near my house in downtown Toronto. And I absolutely love it because it's, pretty awesome it's a pretty awesome place to commute whether you're a cyclist, a transit user, a pedestrian, or a driver. Anyone been to Toronto? Yay, yay Toronto. So like North, most of North America, Toronto's road and highway infrastructure was originally built to support cars and cars alone. And some of our politicians like to remind us of this a lot, which is cool. Uh, but as our city has grown and cycling and public transit started to mature as an alternative mode of transportation, we've adapted the system to fit the needs of everyone, not just cars. And I think NPM has gone through a similar transition. Although it was originally designed to support Node, it's now adapted to serve a much broader set of use cases. So something that I hear a lot from the people at NPM who are incredibly talented and competent um, is that dependency management is really hard to get right. And part of that is because it's obviously a huge engineering challenge. But I think another reason for that is that in any large system that adapts to an increasingly diverse set of users, defining the right way to do things becomes much more nuanced. This is true about software as much as it is about good, good city infrastructure. So when it comes to topics like performance, reliability, intuitive design, the idea th that things should just 
work out of the box. People have really different opinions about what that means, and for good reasons. And when those opinions collide, well, sometimes we tend to react in a somewhat emotional way, shall we say. So in Toronto, for example, this is a game I like to call passive-aggressive license plate photography, or as the other side likes to call it, give the asshole cyclist the finger. So, you know, difference of opinions, not expressed so well. Kind of reminds you of some GitHub issues, doesn't it? Yeah. This one's from San Francisco, just yesterday. Um, so I like to think that we can do better. You know, there's a more productive approach um, to using strategies to deal with our unique requirements and challenges as front-end users of NPM. So let's do that. Let's talk about it. So I'm going to start, off, start us off with an example of a brand new Greenfields kind of project. So this is a little web app called Bike Lane Go, and it's a lot like a popular mobile app you might be familiar with. So go emoji. <laughs> All right. So I would have actually really liked to build this, but unfortunately, you know, I was doing Firefox stuff, and it's only theoretical. So if you want to go ahead and do it, I'll be your biggest fan, OK? All right, so what we're going to do with this, we can use any module loader we want, which is great. Um, we're going to use React for the UI, because why not? And we're going to use maybe the Get User Media Web API. And we have to make sure, and this is important, that it's small and fast enough to run properly on mobile phones. So to start things off, we're going to make a directory, and we're going to go into it, and we're going to npm init, which you've already heard from. Uh, other speakers about, so you know what that does. We're going to npm install all of the dependencies we need for our app. Okay, so there we go. React, everything, React. You know. <laughs> yeah, so, you know, this is everything we need. Um, so, you know, you're going to need more, but this is a good start. So, so far, nothing different from Node. We've done exactly what you do if you're writing Pokemon, or sorry, oops. Uh, <laughs> bike lane go, you know, server. It's the same thing. Where we first start to diverge from how things work in Node is module loading. So in Node, we have a simple module loader that's built into core that works out of the box with NPM, which is awesome, and you probably know it as the require function. If you've never looked at some of the source code for the module stuff, it's pretty interesting. I highly recommend it. But in the browser, um, as of right now, we don't yet have an implemented standard for module loading, at least one that we have across the board. And our constraints are very different. So Node, when we call require, we load and cache modules from the file system, you know, when we start the program up. But we only have to do this one, because we only have to do this once at startup, um, and, you know, we tend to use high-powered machines, the cost of installing and loading a large number of files is pretty minimal. That's fine. But in the browser, on the other hand, we don't have a file system to work with. We need to rely on users to load resources from the network. So at the bare minimum, it means we need to transform our file system of source modules into a resource browsers understand how to fetch. Uh, another thing we have to do, though, is to be mindful of our users, particularly on mobile devices. So we need to make sure we're reducing the size and content our of our files to what's absolutely necessary. You know, we need to reduce the number of HTTP requests, at least right now. Um, and we need to be able to deal with partial failures or slow connections. If you're wondering, we do have a specification for modules in ES 2015 that defines a new syntax, so the import and the export declarations, um, as well as an implementation of a loader that's actually in progress in several browsers, including Firefox. Um, but today I'm going to be talking about strategies you can go home and use right now. In the future, we'll probably use a combination of built-in browser features as well as tools from user land in order to continue to integrate into the NPM ecosystem because that's the best way to do the web, right? That was for my boss. Yeah. Um, so speaking of, of user land, um, you know, there's a, quite a few module loader implementations you can use uh, for front-end implementation, uh, front-end integration with NPM. So one of the more popular ones these days is Webpack. Um, so I'm going to show you that today with our example. So with Webpack, um, you know, it allows us to import modules synchronously with a require function. There's also a way to do it asynchronously, but we're going to stick with this. 
Um, we can also use as of Webpack 2, the native ES2015 module definition syntax, if you prefer, which is totally cool. Um, where Webpack difference, uh, differs from Node's module loader is that instead of importing files at runtime, Webpack has a compile step that transforms your files into functions in a single file or a set of chunks, which can be executed as needed. So, you know, as we can see here, we end up with a single JS file, main.bundle.js, and we link that in the HTML page of our bike lane go app. So that's really awesome because it's saving us HTTP requests. So what about NPM? So by default, Webpack will resolve relative paths relative to the file and absolute paths relative to node modules. If you want, you can actually add your own configuration for you know, resolving stuff into other folders. So for example, if I do um, my source directory in this resolve setting, it will first look for modules in source and then it will fall back to node modules if it can't find it. So that's pretty cool. Um, so for our bike lane go app, here's our main JS. We're requiring React. Um, you know, we've got a single component and we're rendering it. We also have this like awesome necessary plugin called React Instinct. I don't know, I guess we need it. Um, so, but if we look at our node modules directory, including all of our dev dependencies, it's about 47 megabytes combined which, you know, if you ended up loading a site that was 47 megabytes, um, well, let's just put it this way, it's not gonna load, right? So, um, if we run Webpack, just, you know, straight off of our configuration, our bundle is about 800K, and that's because Webpack actually only includes files that have been explicitly called from our source code. So that's better, and it's great. We can load external dependencies, and it's working. It would totally run at this point, but honestly, if you go out into the world with an 800K um, JavaScript file that just has React and like one plugin in it, I'm gonna be really sad, and you're gonna be really sad. So don't do it. So let's figure out, you know, we'll look at React specifically since it's a pretty large and common dependency. Let's analyze this problem. So without Webpack, the development uh, build of React.js is about 687K. So that's a development build. And the production build is about 145. Our bundle is 800K, so there's something going on here. So it sounds like a job for the bundle detective. <laughs> you know, the truth is out there. Um, yes. So the first tool I like to use as a bundle detective um, is to start with Webpack, since Webpack is focused on the files that we're actually executing. Um, and use the dash dash JSON output parameter. So what that actually does is it um, outputs stats for all chunks and modules, including the size and the dependency tree of each one. So, you know, this is only for files included in your bundle. It's not very usable in this state, so let's look at what we can do with that. Um, there's actually a tool on Webpack's uh, website that you can upload stats to it, and it will visualize them. So basically you just upload it, and yeah, it sort of creates this really awesome spider thing that looks really cool. It's not particularly useful but to me, <laughs> but it looks really cool. Um, I don't know, maybe I just, I don't know. I, I mean, I'm, maybe I'm more of a, a text person. Um, but yeah, it is cool. So personally, I prefer to use a little command line tool that's available on NPM as Webpack Bundle Size Analyzer. So the way that works is you basically, instead of just doing webpack, you do webpack dash dash JSON, and then pipe that into the size analyzer. And it will basically give you a list of all of your dependencies, you know, what percentage of the bundle they are, um, and all their sub-dependencies. So that's pretty cool. So let's say we run this for our awesome um, bike lane go app, and this is what it looks like. So you know, sometimes it'll just show us that like one file, like moment, for example, might be super huge and we need to do some work to optimize it. But when we look here, we see we have a bigger problem. Holy crap, it looks like there's two versions of React, one at the top level and one in this like React Instinct plugin. You know, what the heck is going on? So we see that we have duplicates, let's verify this with NPM. We can use the NPM LS command which can either print out your entire dependency tree like this, or in our case, we want, we know React is the issue, so we're gonna target React specifically. 
So sure enough, we've got two versions of React, one at 15.3 uh, 15 and one at 14.8. So this is the point where you might do something like this, you know, sigh in disdain, um, tweet about how Webpack or NPM or React sucks, or you know, Team Instinct sucks for making this package, you know. Um, or, you know, as we might do at Mozilla when faced with such situations, we start building our own implementation of everything. So, <laughs> you know. <laughs> um, but don't worry. Don't do that, okay? Keep calm. We can deal with this, okay? So let's ask the question, why do duplicates happen? So what I'm going to show you is based off of NPM's excellent documentation. I think it's right, but I'm not an NPM expert employee, so you should ask them if you want further clarification. But let's do this, let's do this. All right, so it used to be in NPM 2 that if we had three dependencies, say Mystic, Valor, and Instinct, and they all required the same version of Pokemon package, you know, version 2, they would each install their own copy of it, and that's cool. But in NPM 3, as you might know, NPM will actually optimize for a maximally flat dependency tree by bringing the first version of a dependency it installs to the top level. And that means when Mystic installs Pokemon, assuming Mystic was first, you know, it goes to the top of the tree, and then Valor and, oops, did I screw that up? Animate, damn it. There we go. It goes to the top of the tree, and if Valor and Instinct also install the exact same version, they will not install their own copies. And this is awesome because for front end developers, we want to, you know, prevent duplication. So however, if Mystic and Valor install Pokemon 2, and as usual it goes to the top of the tree, but Instinct needs Pokemon 1, it will be installed as a sub-dependency of Instinct, just like NPM 2 used to work, okay, like that. So sometimes this can still happen for a lot of reasons. Uh, one of them is if, say, we have different ranges in Semver. So in this case, some of our dependencies require any minor version of version 2, um, but instinct requires any minor version of two or greater than two or greater, greater than or equal to one. So we end up with two versions of Pokemon, even though technically we could have one. And that's sad because we don't want that. So if this happens, NPM has a tool to fix this. So as long as the package Semver ranges are compatible, NPM will be able to dedupe them. So try this first before you do anything else. Unfortunately, when we run npm dedupe in our package, this does not fix our problem. And upon closer inspection, we can see that the author of React Instinct, you know, this team instinct person, uh, defined a specific version of React that is not compatible with our version of React, even though the package should work fine with 15. Like, that sucks. So I just want to talk a for a second about versioning for something like a React plugin, mainly for front-end consumption. While locking your dependencies is generally a good idea, you know, as a consumer of NPM packages because it makes your build more predictable, if you're writing a plugin, you probably want to declare a range of versions um, for which your plugin is compatible. So don't lock it to that one version because you're going to get duplication. Yeah. So I know this makes testing more complicated, but it's kind of necessary to prevent, you know, bad things from happening. Um, so in the React community, a lot of people are using something called peer dependencies, which is kind of controversial, so if you want to know more about that, probably ask uh, the NPM folks. You know, or, oh, that was a, a ooh, jeez, I didn't know that was such a sore topic. I mean, go and read some issues and get context for, anyways. Um, so, moving on. So we have two incompatible versions of React Defined because Team Instinct screwed up and defined, you know, a fixed version for 0.14 package. But we really want to make this work. We really want this. So at this point, we have a couple of options to hack things up on the Webpack side. And I personally am a huge fan of hacks, so I'm sorry if you're not. Um, one thing we could do is override the resolve configuration option to Webpack. So that any time React is called by a module or its dependencies, Webpack will always resolve to your top level React package. And yeah, this is totally a hack and it's you know, outside of NPM, but it does work. So if you have no other options, try it. Um, this is also really useful if you have trouble optimizing the full Webpack build of something. 
Um, so if you want to just use this pre-built pre file instead, you know, you can just link to the pre-built file and then still do require React, which is cool. Um, another thing you can do to reduce duplication is to use Webpack's built-in optimized dedupe plugin, which will actually search the tree for duplicate files um, at compile time and then take them out. So I highly recommend this too. So after resolving duplicates and applying Webpack's optimizations, our bundle is now at 136K. That's like 600 or something um, K saved, you know, thanks to a little bit of sleuthing. So if you can, you know, set up an automated test for it. Uh, make sure your bundle size doesn't go out of control um, and, you know, do more analysis if it's not working out. So this is great for our state-of-the-art, brand new bike line go, or bike lane go project. But what about legacy front-end systems? Can NPM still help us there? Can we have dependency management without throwing everything out? So I want to talk about a legacy system that is particularly important to me uh, called Firefox. And uh, one of the things that I've been working on in Firefox is something called Activity Stream, which is a better way to look at how you do things in your browser and all of your activity. So we've built a lot of this with modern web tech, but we still have to build APIs in the context, you know, in the constraints of Firefox itself, which is, you know, a 20-year-old or so code base. And I've been thinking about how we can incrementally do things better. And I have to say that using external dependencies is definitely the top of my list. So if you do work in a legacy code base, who, who works in a legacy code base, at least some of the time? Yeah, most of us. I mean, we're probably mostly spoiled here, but a lot of people have to do that. Um, and you know, you probably have some way of making things work. A lot of people have a, like a vendor folder that gets checked into the repo that you manually update. Um, and it kind of sucks, so let's see if, you know, we can make that better. So remember this? Yeah. Awesome. So it sucks for a lot of reasons, but this is like a way of loading modules, okay? So maybe you've upgraded a bit and you've concatenated those files in a single bundle. That's cool, that's cooler. Um, in Firefox, we actually have a few different custom module loading systems. So you might have that too. We even have an implementation of CommonJS that um, we can use with the add-on SDK. So it's pretty good, um, but it unfortunately doesn't integrate with NPM, so we still need to figure that part out. So one thing to keep in mind when you're working on integrating new systems into a legacy one, don't try to rewrite the whole thing at once. Just don't. And you know, maybe you, maybe you could, but Firefox is millions of lines of code, so it's pretty much out of the question for us. Um, yeah, so instead consider writing a proxy for your module loader of choice so that you can start ex including external dependencies without having to take the whole system down. So it's, all, again, this is a bit of a hack, but if you write a proxy to import modules from NPM and then use Webpack or another module loader of choice to transform that into a compatible interface with your legacy system, you get all the benefits of being able to install and track um, external dependencies without having to change the way your system loads modules. So let's see what that looks like in our Firefox project. So first we create a file called vendor.js and we simply export each external dependency we want to take advantage of in the old system. All right, so then on the Webpack side, we can use a couple of settings in the configuration object. So in this case, we're specifying a library target var, which means it outputs a global variable and we're naming the variable vendor. So in your legacy file, all you need to do is include that script, so the output of the bundle in a script tag, and then you just do window.vendor.avocado or .pokemon or whatever else, .wombat. Um, in our Firefox project, we're actually gonna use the common JS library target, which actually means that Webpack outputs a bundle that exports the compiled result of all our dependencies. So this is really useful if you have um, you know, a common JS system, but it's not compatible with NPM. So in our Firefox code, all we need to do now is require the vendor bundle and then get avocado from that. Boom, we have access to NPM. Awesome, right? So Firefox must still be Firefox, and we have external dependencies, yay. So obviously there's a lot more work to be done here, um, but focusing on what we really need and then making some compromises 
allows us to have better things. So, you know, I've talked a little bit about analyzing your tree, about deduplicating, about using Webpack to make shit happen, about what it looks like to add NPM into a legacy code base. And there's a lot of things the community has discovered to make front-end dev with NPM better, as well as planning by NPM to make sure it continues to improve. So that's awesome. But I think the most important thing to remember is that NPM serves a very diverse set of use cases, which is both extremely hard and extremely awesome. So keep publishing, keep hacking, maybe come visit me for a bike ride in Toronto sometime, and thank you very much. Yeah. <laughs>